the Executive Director of the American Trauma Society. And I'm pleased to uh, welcome you to the first of a two-part educational webinar uh, for trauma registry professionals on ICD-9 and ICD-10 external cost codes. Cost codes. The lecture series is presented by Holly Hedegaard, uh, MD, an injury epidemiologist and the manager of the Injury Statistics Program in the Office of Analysis and Epidemiology at the CDC National Center for Health Statistics. Part one today uh, will focus on ICD-9 external cause code decision making. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we hope you will be able to identify the fundamental elements required to identify the correct injury external cause code, achieve familiarity with the ICD-9 decision tree process for coding external cause codes, achieve familiarity with the CDC external cause code matrix, and achieve familiarity with how NTDS maps external cause codes for identification of trauma injury types. About our speaker today, Holly Hattegaard uh, is an injury epidemiologist at the CDC. From 1994 to 2012, she served as a medical injury epidemiologist at Colorado State Health Department, managing the Injury Epidemiology Program, the Colorado Trauma Registry, and the Colorado Emergency Medical Services Information System. While in Colorado, Dr. Hedegaard also taught and conducted research as an adjunct faculty member in the Department of Preventative Medicine and Biometrics at the Colorado School of Public Health. Dr. Hedegaard has served on several national injury surveillance work groups, including various committees that developed consensus recommendations for injury surveillance in state health departments, assessed an expanded definition for injury using hospital discharge data systems, and identified strategies to improve injury surveillance. While at NCHS, Dr. Hedegaard has been instrumental in developing tools and resources for working with injury coded in ICD-10. We are very excited and happy to welcome Dr. Hedegaard today. Um, a, few house, a few housekeeping uh, items. If you do have questions, uh, we will be answering them throughout the presentation today. Uh, in your GoToWebinar control panel, uh, there is a section in the middle of the control panel which allows you to type in questions. Please submit those throughout the presentation. We will stop periodically to answer those questions, and we'll leave time at the end as well to answer those questions. This webinar today is being recorded and will be posted to the ATS website within a week at the end of the webinar. Uh, the webinar slides will be available and sent to the e email that you have registered uh, for this webinar today. Uh, on behalf of the American Trauma Society, I want to welcome and thank again Dr. Hedegaard, and I will turn it over to her. Well, hello, and thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you about external cause codes. Um, as Ian said, um, before coming here to the National Center for Health Statistics, I actually worked at the State Health Department in Colorado, um, and it was there one of my responsibilities was doing the state trauma registry. And I met a lot of the registrars through all the different hospitals in Colorado. And um, because this was in the early 1990s, um, it was before the time of the NTDB, before the time of the National Trauma Data Standards. So we had to work on things together. There wasn't really a national standard to refer to. So um, I just want to give a big shout out to um, the trauma registrars in Colorado because they taught me a lot about trauma registries. We worked together to develop some of the decision tools and, and uh, resources that I'm going to mention to you today. Um, and I just am very grateful for all the time that I had uh, to spend with those trauma registrars. So a big shout out to them. If we go to the next slide, I just want to give you a general overview of what I'm going to try to cover in the next hour or so. Um, I'm going to talk about some general coding rules when it comes to the assignment of external cause codes and then sort of get into um, some very broad categories of codes. And um, I'm not going to have time to sort of go over every single code in the coding manual. You know, there's over 1,300 codes available. Um, what I'm going to do is talk in, um, in, in terms of groups of codes and then mostly highlight codes that sometimes are problematic or sometimes people have questions about. So I'm not going to address everything, but I'm going to try to at least provide some specifics. And in talking about these different code groups, I will be going over some of the um, decision trees that we developed with the Colorado Trauma Registry um, in three particular areas. One is on transportation, one on falls, and one on burns. 
So I'll go into those in a little bit more depth just because those tended to be areas where there was a lot of um, concern or confusion about what was the appropriate code to assign. Then um, after sort of talking about these specific codes, I'll talk a little bit about the ICD-9CM external cause code matrix. The matrix was designed to be able to categorize the external cause codes by um, cause of injury and by intent of injury. So I'll provide a little bit more detail about that. Um, and then I'll talk about how NTDS maps these external cause codes uh, using that matrix and maps them to trauma type. And by trauma type, what I'm talking about is blunt versus penetrating or burns, that type of thing. So um, on the next slide here, um, I just wanted to provide you with a couple websites that might be helpful for you. Um, this is the National Center for Health Statistics website on ICD-9-CM. The National Center for Health Statistics uh, works in conjunctions with the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services um, to create the ICD-9-CM. So any new codes that are added, any rules around use of those codes are developed in conjunction between NCHS and CMS. And this website, where um, it's listed under general information, provides the latest uh, versions of the ICD-9-CM, information about what new codes have been added, that type of thing. Additionally, the official coding guidelines, uh, or guidelines for coding and reporting are also found on that website. One thing to keep in mind is that these coding guidelines were actually developed more for medical records coders. And so there are, are some rules there that might be uh, particular to the medical records coders and less relevant necessarily for trauma registrars. So it's worth taking a look um, at those coding guidelines, but some of them will apply, some of them might not apply um, for use of these external cause codes uh, for trauma registries. So if we move to the next slide, you know, just as a quick overview, uh, I'm sure most of you know this already, but the external cause codes or E codes are used for classifying injury events by mechanism or cause of injury as well as by intensive injury. Um, I'm going to just say a word here. Uh, we have a tendency in talking in ICD-9-CM to abbreviate these as E-codes, but the reality is we really should be thinking about them as external cause codes. Because when we move forward from ICD-9-CM to ICD-10-CM, the external cause codes in 10-CM um, do not start with that prefix E. They start with V, W, Y, X, Z, those types of letters. So it'll pretty soon become, when we move to ICD-10-CM, that an E code is not even at all related to injury. So it's helpful to start thinking about these in terms of labeling them external cause codes rather than E codes. On this slide, I sort of show you the very broad groups of the codes. Um, by the intent of injury. So the unintentional injuries are coded with E800 to E949. The intentional um, injuries, which include homicide, suicide, intentional self-harm, and terrorism, are in the range of E950 to E969 and E979, which are the terrorism codes. The legal intervention codes are E970 to E978. And um, those injury events that are undetermined uh, intent are E980 to E989. Next slide, please. So the whole purpose of this webinar today is to give some guidance in terms of how do you select the right E code. And one of the things that really sort of helps with that is if you have access to a full coding manual. And the reason why that's important is that there are a lot of definitions as well as specifics about what's included or excluded in a given code. I know hospitals can vary in terms of the resources available, and, and for some of you, maybe you only have a short list of codes, or you have only the drop-down screens in your software, that sort of thing. It makes it really hard to do accurate coding if you don't have a full coding manual. Um, I know ATS also recommends that registrars refer to a manual uh, whenever possible. They just have a lot of information that will really help in selecting the best code. So I'm really encouraging you that if you do not currently use a coding manual, um, if you try to get your hands on one, um, because it really will help you with your coding skills. Even when using a coding manual, it's easy to just jump to what's called a tabular list of codes. 
But the way the medical records coders are actually trained is that you look in the index first before going to the tabular list. So um, the index for the external cause codes generally follows the index to diseases in these coding manuals. And here it's really helpful to look things up um, in the index first to see what code is recommended. And then from there, you go to the tabular list to read additional details, paying particular attention to the inclusion and exclusion notes. Um, one thing to, to also keep in mind is in the tabular listing, um, if a particular scenario is not included in that code, generally an alternative code is provided. So um, the, the index as well as the tabular listing and all the information in the coding manual really help guide you to get the best code for the given scenario. Next slide, please. So uh, let's start uh, looking at some of these general coding rules. This first one is um, talking about that there are specific external cause codes for acute injuries as well as for late effects. So um, what's the difference? Well, most trauma registries tend to focus on acute injuries, so injuries that happened uh, very recently, um, not people who have um, prolonged outcomes from injuries. And that's typically what's captured in trauma registries. So when you're looking at the codes, um, you want to be sure that you're assigning an external cause code that's relevant for an acute injury. The guidelines say that you need to assign as many E codes as necessary to describe um, the injury event. And I know, again, for some of you, depending on the software that you're using to capture um, the data, you might have only one space for an external cause code. Maybe you have more than one space. Um, but the coding guidelines suggest that you should use as many codes as you need to adequately describe. And the coding guidelines also suggest that the very first code that you assign um, should relate to the, uh, the cause that, that resulted in the most serious diagnosis. In terms of the late effect codes, um, these are a particular subset, E929, E959, E969, E977, E989, and E999. These are typically codes that are more applied for readmissions or if somebody's coming back for um, treatment um, because of a late effect of an initial injury. So these codes should not be used uh, whenever you're talking about an acute injury. Next slide, please. So um, when medical records uh, coders are trained in coding, um, an important consideration for them is the order in which the external cause codes are assigned. And so this slide talks a little bit about sort of that ordering and the priority level. Again, this might not be so relevant for trauma registries, but in order to sort of be comprehensive in my description here, I wanted to at least mention this or let people be aware of this. Um, medical records coders are instructed to follow the priority order that's shown on this slide when they're assigning multiple E codes. The highest priority is given to child or adult abuse, um, and then followed by terrorism, cataclysmic events, and transportation. So for example, if someone was injured in a motor vehicle crash on a roadway when he was driving his car in a tornado, the first E code would be E908.1 for the tornado, which is considered a cataclysmic event, followed by E810 to E819, one of the transportation codes for motor vehicle traffic. Within the world of transportation, there's also a hierarchy, which is shown at the bottom of this slide. So for example, if a plane was taking off and crashed into a car, you'd code E840, accident to powered aircraft at takeoff or landing, and then assign the appropriate code for the motor vehicle aspect of the event. So again, um, for medical record coders, they have this hierarchy that they're supposed to use. You might choose to use it or not when it comes to your trauma registry. Next slide, please. So now that we've talked about some general concepts, um, I want to get into some details about assigning specific E codes. And the first broad category I'd like to talk about is transportation. And although this category covers all modes of transportation, um, I'm going to focus on the codes for events involving motor vehicles and other road vehicles, since these codes can sometimes be sort of tricky. 
And in the interest of time, I won't be speaking about the codes related to aircraft or to watercraft. So um, I mentioned that I had worked with the trauma registrars in Colorado. And um, because I was at the state health department, I uh, got to see the codes that were coming in from all the different hospitals. And a lot of times there would be consistency within a hospital, but sometimes there were lots of differences between the hospitals in terms of which codes were assigned. And this was particularly true around motor vehicle events. Um, these codes can be really tricky because there's so many different sort of combinations of things that um, look very similar and it can be hard to tell exactly which code I should pick. You know, what does this other vehicle mean? What does this mean? That type of thing. So um, in, in working with the trauma registrars, um, it, it became clear that in order to pick the right code, you really need to be thinking about a couple things. Number one, the types of vehicles that are involved in the event, and then also where the event happened. Because these two things will help guide you to uh, choosing the best code for the scenario. So what I want to do is talk about these in a little bit of detail. I'm going to uh, mention some things here about some of the definitions. So motor vehicle, most people have a pretty good idea about what that means. You know, it includes cars and trucks, buses, and that sort of thing. But it also includes motorized scooters and mopeds. And the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, any object that's being towed by a motor vehicle is considered part of the motor vehicle. There's also a very uh, specific definition of what an off-road motor vehicle is. Um, it's a motor vehicle of special design enabled to negotiate through rough or soft terrain or snow. And it includes such things as ATVs, army tanks, hovercraft, uh, snowmobiles, dirt bikes, motocross. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about off-road motor vehicles. Next slide. Um, pedestrian, that's pretty straightforward. Most people sort of understand what a pedestrian is, a person on foot, um, or somebody who's operating a pedestrian conveyance, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But it also includes people who might be by the side of the highway changing a tire or, you know, their car broke down and they're fixing the motor um, and so they're standing by their vehicle. So just, you don't have to actually be walking. You just have to be sort of not in or on a motor vehicle. Pedestrian conveyance, um, this is another sort of group of, of uh, uh, terms that you ought to be familiar with. Um, a pedestrian conveyance is any human power device by which a pedestrian could move um, other than by walking. So all of these things listed here are considered pedestrian conveyances. And so um, if any of any people who are using these things become injured, when you're assigning the fourth digit for the external cause code for the transportation codes, um, you need to make sure that they're identified as being a pedestrian. Next slide, please. Moving on and talking about some other things, agricultural and construction machines. These include um, things like tractors, cranes, and, and bulldozers. These can be a little tricky because it depends on what they're doing at the time the injury event happens. So if, if these types of um, vehicles are on a roadway, under their own power and moving down the roadway, then they're considered a motor vehicle and would be assigned a code in the E810 to E819 range. But if they're not on a roadway and they're out in a field, like a tractor out in a field or at a construction site, that type of thing, in those instances, they're considered machinery. And instead of giving it a motor vehicle code, you would give it a machinery code, which is E919. The other thing to keep in mind is that there are some vehicles that um, are used entirely on industrial premises. And these are things like, uh, like when you're at the airport and you see those little go-karts that sort of come rolling down the highway, uh, not the highway, but uh, down the aisles in the airport, um, taking passengers from one gate to the next. Or if you see the, the baggage um, equipment out there as they're um, unloading it from the airplane. Anything where the vehicle is used entirely on an industrial premises, there's a specific code for those, and um, that's E846. So you might want to keep that in mind as well, that these are not considered in the same realm as motor vehicles. Another example of these vehicles um, entirely on industrial premises 
are you know coal cars or uh, trams or trucks or things that are used in a mining operation. So uh, again, those aren't considered the same as motor vehicles on a roadway. The last item I have here is railways, and that's pretty straightforward, things that are on uh, trains and those sorts of things on rails. But keep in mind it also um, includes light rail and subways and streetcars. Um, and what's sort of unique about railway is it's always considered railway whether or not that vehicle is in motion. For most of the other types of vehicles, they're considered a vehicle if they're in motion. They're considered an object if they're not in motion. But for railway, it's a little bit different. It doesn't matter whether or not um, the railway vehicle is moving. It's still considered a, roll, a railway vehicle. All right, so let's move to the next slide. So now that we've talked a little bit about the types of vehicles, I want to talk a little bit about where the event happened, because that's also equally as important when it comes to deciding what are the best codes to assign. So uh, there's um, two big broad categorizations uh, to think about. One is, did the event happen on a roadway? And by roadway, what we mean is something that's open for use by the public for the purposes of vehicular traffic. And so these are things like streets, roadways, highways, etc. Okay. But in contrast to that is um, things that are not considered a roadway. And these are things like parking lots, driveways, private roads, off-road, those types of things. So um, those events that happen on not a roadway are considered motor vehicle non-traffic events. And the codes that are used for those events are E820 to E825. So uh, now that we've sort of talked about the vehicles and we've talked a little bit about the location, um, I want to start going into some of the decision trees that we developed uh, um, when working on the Colorado uh, Trauma Registry. Um, and it helps, the purpose of these decision trees was to sort of help guide you um, to making the best choice possible um, in terms of selecting the code. So I've got three slides coming up here talking about um, the decision tree for vehicular events. And here's the first one. And I know it looks really complex. Um, it might be sort of tricky to go through, but we'll sort of work our way through this a little bit at a time. You can see the two key questions are up here at the top. So the first key question is, is a motor vehicle involved? So for example, if it was a roadway event, but it was a bicycle and the bicyclist fell off their bike as they were riding in the street, that's not considered a motor vehicle. There was no motor vehicle involved in that event. Um, if that bicyclist was hit by a motor vehicle, then yes, there was a motor vehicle involved. So depending on whether or not a motor vehicle is involved would tell you whether or not you stay on this page or you move to the page of slide three. Let's assume that this involves a motor vehicle event. So a motor vehicle is involved, then the next question to answer is where did the event occur? So we have a couple options here. One is on the street, highway, public roadway that I mentioned. The other is driveway, parking lot, private road. This slide focuses solely on those events that happen on a street, highway, or public roadway. So we're talking about the set of codes within E810 to E819. So if you know it's a motor vehicle on a public roadway, then you know this is the range of codes that you ought to be looking at to decide where you go from here. If you look over on the left-hand side of the slide, there are very specific scenarios now. So um, did it, was it involving a train? If so, you would use E810. Did it involve um, a non-motorized vehicle? So this is that scenario of the car hitting a bicyclist. Okay? But keep in mind that the other vehicle in this instance is non-motorized. So if it's a non-motorized vehicle and a motor vehicle, you would use E813. Then the last one is the pedestrian. So if it's a motor vehicle uh, colliding with a pedestrian or a person who's using a pedestrian conveyance, you would use E814. All right. So if we move over to the right-hand side of this slide, then the two big questions are, was there only one motor vehicle involved? Or were there two or more motor vehicles involved? So if there's only one motor vehicle involved, then you can start thinking about, okay, well then what happened to that one motor vehicle? 
So did that motor vehicle collide on the highway? Um, if so, then you would use E815. Did the motor vehicle lose control or roll over? So a lot of the rollover events or a person falling asleep at the wheel, so they end up driving the car off the highway, you use E816. Was somebody hurt trying to get into or out of the motor vehicle? If so, you would use E817. And if there was some other non-collision scenario, and some examples are given here, then you would use E818. And if the details of the incident aren't known, then that's when you use E819. So those are some of your choices that are available if you know that it was a single motor vehicle that was involved in this event. Um, if there are two or more motor vehicles, then there's actually only two particular codes that you would need to consider. And one is really specific. Um, it's a specific scenario where the motor vehicle um, drove off the road, came back on the road, and then hit another car. And why they have a code so specific for this one little scenario, I don't know, but they do. So that's E811. Um, I don't think it gets used very much, but that means it makes it easier for you because that way, if there are two or more motor vehicles, most times the code you're going to want to be looking at is E812. So this includes things like um, the head-on, rear-end, T-bone, hitting a parked car, those types of events. So it really actually simplifies things a little bit by asking these sort of key questions and working your way through these decision trees to help get you to the code that might be best for the scenario that you're looking for. So let's move to the next slide, which is actually the second in the series of motor vehicle e-code slides. And this is um, the, the codes that are relevant to uh, cases where a motor vehicle is involved, but the event happened um, in a driveway, a parking lot, a private road, or off-road. Okay? So these are the non-traffic events. And there are some very specific items. If you look over on the left-hand side, did it involve a snowmobile? If it involved a snowmobile, you use E820. Um, if it involved a specific off-road motor vehicle, you would use E821. Okay, so those are very specific. But if it's just any type of motor vehicle that's in an off-road setting, then you look at the questions that are over there on the right-hand side of the decision tree. So again, it goes. Um, you can ask yourself these types of questions. Did it involve a collision with a moving object? And here, it includes such things as an animal, a non-motor vehicle or a bike, a pedestrian, another motor vehicle, or a train, and that type of thing. And again, remember you're in an off-road setting. So um, in that case, you would use E822. If it involved a motor vehicle colliding with a stationary object, you would use E823. If it involved someone who got hurt while they were trying to get into or out of the car, um, it would be E824. And any other scenario, it would then be E825. So again, trying to simplify this to really limit how many choices you're sort of gathering through, looking through, to decide which code is the best code for your scenario. Um, as a reminder, at the very bottom of this slide, um, for both the previous uh, decision tree as well as this one, um, it's important to remember to include the fourth digit to identify who the injured person is. So um, these fourth digits that are shown here on this slide are relevant for both E810 to E819 and also E820 to E825. So um, again, a lot of times people want to know if it was a motorcyclist, if it was a pedestrian, who was it that got hurt? So it's really important to make sure that you include these codes when you can, when you have that information available to you. Let's move to the next slide. And this is um, the third part of the motor vehicle decision tree. This is if the answer to the question, is a motor vehicle involved? If the answer to that question is no, then these are the types of codes you might want to look at. Okay? So if the event um, solely involved a bicycle, so this could be a, a guy riding their bicycle on a, on a bike path. Or um, in Colorado, we had a lot of people who went mountain biking. So no car or no vehicle, motor vehicle uh, there, but just a bicycle. If that's the case, then you would use E826. Um, 
The next one is very specific in animal-drawn vehicles. So, you know, if you have a horse and buggy and uh, somehow somebody got injured, that would be the E827. Um, the next one is for an animal being ridden, uh, which is E828. But keep in mind, this includes things more than just horseback riding. So, for example, in Colorado, we had um, a lot of rodeo activity, and um, we would have these things for small kids called mutton busting, where uh, kids would be riding on back on the backs of muttons. Um, and so, the animal is being ridden, so you would use this code. Same thing with bull riding or any of that type of thing. So anytime an animal is being ridden, we would use E828. And then your last choice here is E829, which is for anything else other than those three, bicycle, animal drawn vehicle, animal being ridden. Anything else, you would use the non-motor vehicle, E829. Um, this set of codes also has a fourth digit that you need to think about. The fourth digit for these codes are slightly different than for um, the E810 to E19 and the E820 to E824. So make sure you're working with the right set of fourth digit codes when you're working with these um, external cause codes. All right, so um, the next slide, just sort of, I, I just wanted to summarize um, on the next slide, just to speak a minute about bicycle-related injuries, um, because they, they can really be sort of tricky. It depends on whether or not it's a bicycle plus a motor vehicle or a bicycle alone. So if it's a bicycle plus a motor vehicle, then you need to think about, is it on a public roadway or not on a public roadway? If it's on a public roadway, then the right choice would be E813.6. If it's not on a public roadway, you would use E822.6. And if the incident involves a bicycle alone, then you use a third code, E826.1. So again, bicycles are sort of interesting because they have their own sort of world of codes in and of themselves. So at this point, I'd like to just do a brief pause and see if um, there are any questions um, and, and um, make sure that everything is going okay and that people can hear me and all of that as well. So. Any other questions or anything someone wants to bring up now? Holly, I'll read from the uh, questions submitted uh, uh, so far. If someone jumps from a moving car, are they considered a pedestrian? Um, no, I, I think they're still considered an occupant of the vehicle. If they were in the car and they jumped out, they are an occupant at the time that the motion started, that the event started. The second question um, deals specifically around some confusion uh, in regards to someone jumping from a car, being pushed from a car, or falling from the roof or hood of a car. Can you um, provide some specifics in that, uh, in that area? So if someone is in or on a car, they're considered a passenger. So um, it would still be that same sort of scenario of, uh, hold on of them being considered a passenger, not a pedestrian, okay? And um, depending on where they're located, if they're on a roadway, um, then the best code to use would be E817, where it's someone who got hurt while trying to get into or out of the motor vehicle. And um, if somebody is being pushed intentionally, then you have to think about the assault codes because it's no longer an unintentional injury. It's an intentional one. So if somebody um, uh, is, is um, trying to get out of a car, not because somebody is pushing them, but because they're trying to jump out of the car themselves, then that's sort of an unintentional world. If somebody is pushing them intentionally to hurt them, to get them out of the car, then that's an intentional injury and you would look under the assault codes. And there's a specific assault code with that for motor vehicle. Um, I need to look that up real quick. So that would be um, E968.5, so that's the transport vehicle um, under assault by other and unspecified means. The next question um, was asking if you would uh, review 
uh, again, or if you haven't already, uh, motorized wheelchairs, both on and off public highways? So um, motorized wheelchairs are sort of interesting because years ago they were considered a motor vehicle, but I've noticed in the most recent coding guidelines from NCHS, they're considered a pedestrian conveyance. So whether they are um, motorized or not, a wheelchair is considered a pedestrian conveyance. So somebody in a wheelchair is considered a pedestrian, not an occupant of a motor vehicle. So um, I, I think maybe 10 years or so ago, um, a lot of times motorized wheelchairs were considered as a motor vehicle, but these days they are not. So I don't know if that's getting to the person's question, but. Okay. The next question deals with a hypothetical. Um, what if an individual is working on their car and is underneath the car when it falls on them? Um, if their primary injury uh, is burned from the hot engine, would that still uh, be under the vehicular code? Um, so um, that one would be, um, so it depends on if they're um, on the highway or if they're in a uh, parking lot or garage or something like that. So if they're um, in um, a parking lot or a garage or something like that and it falls on them and, and hits them, I would suggest using um, E825 as well as one of the E917 codes about being struck by an object. Can you advise what is considered uh, a PVT or public roadway? Um, there's a very specific definition in the coding manuals about what's considered public roadway. Um, it, it has to do with is it um, maintained by sort of city government, that sort of thing, um, as opposed to a private roadway which is on somebody's personal property where they have the right to deny access. So um, public roadways generally, um, you know, anybody at any time can drive on those roadways. You don't have to get special permission. Typically maintenance of those roadways are done by some sort of governmental entity. Um, that's what should be considered as a public roadway. Any other and specific to their question? Is it? No, just that was that was uh, just a, a very simple question. Um, okay. uh, here's a, another question uh, which deals with a hypothetical. Um, it, what if somebody is pushed out of a car or is run over by another car? So um, again, it depends somewhat on intent. Uh, it, if it's an unintentional event, you use um, the E codes um, in the E810 to E19 range. If the person was always outside the vehicle, the person who got hurt was always outside the vehicle, they are a pedestrian, so somebody who runs over um, uh, a pedestrian, um, then that particular code that you would use um, would be um, uh, E814. If it's an intentional uh, motor vehicle, uh, if somebody's trying to run somebody down and, and kill them, then it's one of the um, assault codes. And I'm sorry, I can't keep these codes in my head. I always have to look them up in the coding manual. But um, the, the one by being struck by a vehicle is uh, the assault code for being struck by a vehicle is E968.5. Okay. Um, the next question is, what classifies a cataclysmic event for environmental e-codes, uh, for example, ice with a motor vehicle crash? So um, there's actually um, a particular section of the coding manual that identifies these cataclysmic events. And so um, these cataclysmic events include such things as hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, blizzards, which include snow and ice. Um, but it, it's more than just ice on the roadway. I mean, it, it means bad snow and ice, um, dust storms, earthquakes, avalanche, uh, collapse of a dam or man-made structure, a tidal wave caused by an earthquake, tsunami. Um, so think of big things. Think of big either weather or, or earth and water events. Um, that's what's sort of meant by cataclysmic. And again, um, the specific codes are in the range of E908 and E909. So if you want to look at that section of your coding manual, you can see some of the descriptions of what's included there for cataclysmic. Uh, 
Okay, the next question again is a, a hypothetical. Uh, can you advise uh, if a vehicle um, on a roadway loses control, leaving the highway and striking a tree, uh, causing motor vehicle crash, what code would be most appropriate? So the most appropriate code is E816. So someone lost control, went off the roadway. If they hit a tree that's off the roadway, um, it's E816 would be the best for that one. So in the interest of time, uh, could we could we hold some of these questions until the end? And I'll do my best uh, at that point. But uh, we have a bit more material to cover. So uh, maybe we can move forward. Would that be OK, Ian? Yeah, uh, we uh, we do have some additional questions, and please, if folks have them throughout the rest of uh, the webinar this afternoon, please continue to send them in, and we will do our best to answer them before the end of the webinar. And um, I'll do my best to answer these uh, scenario-type questions, but I have to admit, um, I have a tendency to, to spend some time looking things up in the coding manual. So um, in the interest of time, I don't want to have my delay in looking things up um, uh, keep us from answering questions. So if you have more generic questions, I'm happy to answer those during the call. And if they're very specific to particular scenarios, um, I might ask you if we could just respond later after the call um, so that I can be sure that I'm giving you the best answer. So, so let's, let's move on from motor vehicle. And now let's start talking a little bit about the next broad topic, which is falls. And in general, the external cause codes for falls are in the category of E880 to E888. But there are a few other codes that also relate to falls that it's important to be aware of. So I'll talk about those a little bit as well. Um, and if you've had a chance to work with any of these codes, you know that there's specific codes for different types of falls, falling from the, on the same level and falling from one level to another. And again, some of these can get a little tricky. So um, in Colorado, we developed a, a decision tree for falls um, that I'm going to go through on the next couple slides. Um, You'll be happy to hear it's not quite as complex as the motor vehicle one, but let's take a look and work our way through it. So if we move to the next slide. The important question to ask when you're working with falls is to know something about the sequence of events. So sometimes uh, a person just falls. That's all that happens in the event. Nothing else happens. But there are other scenarios where sometimes the person falls and then they hit something. Or sometimes the person, um, uh, something hit that person and then they fell. Or sometimes, um, uh, something, uh, sometimes the person hit something and then they fell. So it's, it's these different combinations of what are, the, are happening in the sequence of events. So on this first slide for the fall decision uh, tree, it focuses just on the simple scenario of the person fell. So that's what we're going to focus on on this first slide. And as you can see, there's you know, very specific codes here for different sorts of scenarios, depending on where people fall and how people fall. I'm not going to go over all of these. They're pretty well described. I just want to highlight a couple things. So if you look over on the left-hand side, um, that very last box on the left, where it says, a fall from or out of a building or other structure. And the code that's typically assigned for this one, from or out of a building or other structure, is E882. But something to keep in mind is if that person fell or jumped from a burning building, you actually use codes that come out of the fire flames section of the coding manual. Okay? So if the person is jumping from a burning building, the appropriate code to use would be E890.8 or E891.8. So just something to keep in mind. I, I don't know how often people come across this, but um, there are specific codes if the building is burning. If we move to that middle column and we go to the bottom box in that middle column where it says other fall from one level to another, I just want to highlight the bottom code E884.9. Okay, This is a fall from one level to another. And, um, uh, the, the thing to keep in mind here is that um, a lot of times uh, when I was working on the trauma registry, we would have people who fell off of an animal being ridden. And um, at first, people were using this code, this E884.9, because it seemed to make sense. The person fell from one level to another. But the thing to keep in mind is that if it's an animal being ridden, it's considered a transportation, 
and the better code to use would be E828, which is a fall uh, um, an event involving an animal uh, being ridden. It's one of the transport codes. The last thing I want to highlight is um, in that third column, fall on the same level from slipping, tripping, or stumbling. And again, um, I'm, I want to talk a little bit about E885.9. Um, one of the common scenarios we see for some of our older patients is people who trip over their pets. Um, and so if somebody trips over their dog, um, then you would use this code, E885.9, not the animal code of E906. Okay, so if, if the issue is that they fell after slipping or tripping over their pet, then it should be E885.9. So um, this is the simple, this uh, slide represents sort of the simple fall. I want to now sort of move to the next slide, which is the much more detailed slide that talks about when there's a different sort of sequence of events. Okay, so the first uh, sequence that I want to talk about is on the far left where the person fell and then they hit something. And there are different codes depending on if they fell and hit a sharp object or they fell and hit a non-sharp object. So if they hit a sharp object, it's E880, excuse me, E888.0. If they hit a non-sharp object, it's E888.1. Now the thing to keep in mind is if they fall on a sharp object, you should also add the appropriate E920 code to identify the specific type of sharp object. So for example, if somebody fell while they were holding a knife and they accidentally stabbed themselves, you would code E888.0 for the fall, and you would also code E920.3 for the sharp knife. So keep that in mind. On the topic of fell and struck a non-sharp sharp object, um, I have a little note there about uh, skiing and snowboarding. And again, this is something that sort of came up uh, with our Colorado Trauma Registry. Obviously, skiing and snowboarding are important in our state. Um, there are times where we would have a scenario where uh, a person fell and then they um, hit a tree or something like that. And in those instances, I always encourage the registrars to include the E885.3 or the E885.4 to help identify that it was a skiing or snowboarding event. Um, that's something that we chose to do in Colorado. It's not part of the official coding guidelines, per se. I haven't seen anything that says don't do it, but I haven't seen anything that specifically says do it. Um, but just something to think about because, um, you know, sometimes you want to capture additional information um, that's relevant for the scenario and for the code. So now let's move to the, the last sort of section on this slide. And it's a little bit tricky because these scenarios are sort of difficult to think about in terms of their sequence. So one is where the person hit something and then they fell. The other is something hit the person and then they fell. Okay, But the important thing here is the codes are really relevant based on whether the thing that was being hit was a person or was an object. Okay, So um, if, if the fall sequence involves some involvement with another person, then um, that middle box is what you would use. If the fall event involved hitting or being struck by an object, then that box on the far right are the codes, set of codes you might want to look at. Okay. Keep in mind that um, this code E886.0 must involve another person and must involve a fall. Okay, so if you look in that middle box where it says in sports, um, that code E886.0 should only be applied if it involves um, a fall that resulted from two people colliding in a sports event. Okay, um, If in a sports event uh, one person kicks another person but nobody falls down, then you don't use a fall code. You would use E917.0. So keep in mind that, that um, somebody has to fall in order to use this E886.0 code. Um, the other thing I wanted to just mention briefly is you'll see in the um, uh, box that's on the right-hand side about falling uh, a fall resulting from being struck by or striking an object. One of the codes here, the middle code, 
of striking furniture with a subsequent fall, E917.7. I just want to highlight there's a lot of different falls related to furniture. And this is particularly true, I think, for, for kids. Sometimes you see it with older adults, that type of thing. And so, again, knowing the sequence of events is really important in order to select the right code. So, for example, if somebody fell off of a piece of furniture, they fell off of a table, the right code to use would be E884.5. If somebody fell and then hit a table, the right code to use would be E888.1. And if somebody ran into a table and then fell, you would use E917.7. So that's why I'm sort of suggesting that you really need to know the order of the events, what's happening first, second, and third. Because in all of those events, it involves a fall and furniture, but there's a totally different code that's given depending on the sequence of events. So just something to keep in mind uh, when you're thinking about these fall codes. Let's move to the next slide. And I just want to do a brief word here about sports-related injuries um, because they're somewhat related to the fall codes. Um, again, this one is also, uh, uh, these are also uh, dependent on the sequence of the events. So um, this code that we just previously talked about, the E886.0, fall on the same level in sports due to collision, pushing, shoving by or with another person. So again, make sure that there's at least two people involved before you assign that code. Um, and then the last two are um, part of the E917 series. Um, about being struck against or by a person or object um, in sports and then with or without um, a subsequent fall. So just some codes that specifically mention in sports. Okay, let's move to the next category. This is another big broad category of burns. And um, this is another uh, category for which we've also worked on some decision trees and we'll go over those in a moment here. But the, the big thing to think about when you're looking at burns is determining what was the source of the burn. Was it fire flames? Was it hot liquids? Or was it electricity? Was it explosive material? Because there's a different range of codes, different sets of codes, depending on what caused the burn. So um, on the next couple slides, I have the burn decision tree uh, that might be helpful to sort of work our way through this. And, I have to admit this burn decision tree is uh, not quite as intuitive as the motor vehicle and the falls one. So I'm going to have to sort of work through this um, a little bit at a time. This might be helpful for you, it might not be, but in any event, um, I, I thought it was worth sharing. So um, we have our first key question up in the upper uh, left-hand corner about did the burn result from a flame, a hot object, or an explosion? So um, anything related to hot objects and explosions are on the next slide. We'll get to that in a moment. This slide focuses on um, burns that result from a flame. So we're using the ECODE category of E890 to E899. The next question, now that you've decided that it was done by fire or flame, is um, understanding whether or not it um, happened under a controlled situation or an uncontrolled situation. I remember the first time I started looking at a um, coding manual, and I kept seeing this word conflagration. That's the way the codes are described in the coding manual. And I thought, what the heck is this conflagration business? And basically what conflagration means is that everything has gone up in flames. So the whole house is burning down. Or it's a forest fire, and the whole forest is burning down. And so the, the concept of conflagration is it's totally uncontrolled. Fire is everywhere, OK? That is in contrast to a controlled situation. So a controlled situation is like a fire in a fireplace, or the flames that you might have on a gas stove, um, that type of thing. People with matches or other types of things. Those are considered a controlled situation. So you need to sort of identify whether or not it happened in an uncontrolled situation, everything's up in flames, or in a controlled situation. Then um, the way that these fire uh, codes are sort of set up, there's a lot of importance put into whether or not clothing was also ignited. Okay, So in the world of the controlled situation, you need to also be thinking about, was there any indication that clothing was also set on fire? 
because if there was clothing set on fire, there's another set of codes that you would need to use. Okay? So let me move over to the uh, left hand side where the box says where did the event occur? Okay, so this is really sort of meant to read across as columns. So um, if the event occurred in a private dwelling that was totally up in flames, so a house that's totally up in flames, you would use E890 under uncontrolled situation. If it was a fire in a fireplace, okay, so the fireplace is in a private dwelling, but it's a controlled situation, then you would use E895. And if the person's sleeve of their jacket got on fire um, from being in the fireplace in the house, then you would use E893.0. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. You should sort of kind of read that across. Um, other or unspecified building, the same sort of thing. You could work your way across that way. Not in a building or structure. That's, again, like the forest fire, uh, totally going out of control. Um, that would be the um, uncontrolled situation. Um, and for the forest fire, it's not in a building or structure. So you would actually be on the third line there of that set of codes. If something was like a campfire, OK? So it's a controlled situation, it's a campfire, but it's not in a building or structure, you would use E897. Okay, so, um, and again, if clothing got caught on fire, it would be E893.2. So you can sort of work your way across here and sort of make the choice about was it in a controlled or uncontrolled situation, was it in a house or not in a house. Was it in a house, some other type of building, or not in a house at all. So that's how you sort of work your way through that section. There are also some um, fire and flame codes that are very specific. So the next uh, little patch here is talking about um, did the fire come from a specified source? And so this is blowtorch, candle, cigarette lighter, maps, pipe, welding torch. So if, if the specific thing that's burning somebody is known, it's not just open flames, but it's um, something um, like one of these items, then the right code to use is E898.0 or E898.1. And again, if clothing is caught on fire, you want to include E893.8. The next scenario is, did it come from ignition of highly inflammable material? The thing to keep in mind here is that by inflammable material, they're typically talking about liquids or solids. So it does not include gases, okay? So if this is gasoline caught on fire, that type of thing, that's when you would use E894. And if the source of the fire is not specified at all, that's when you use E899, okay? So hopefully that helps clarify a few things with regard to those uh, fire and flame scenarios. Let's move to the next slide. And this is for um, uh, times when the burns resulted from um, um, hot ob or excuse me, yeah, hot object or explosion. Um, and these are all pretty straightforward, particularly the hot object and, and liquids, hot liquids. I just want to speak a moment to the explosion. And um, the third one down there where it talks about explosive gases, and the code there is E923.2. Um, the scenario here that um, we saw quite frequently in our trauma registry was the person who uh, was on uh, oxygen and was smoking a cigarette and they got a flash burn to their face. So this is the code that you ought to use um, in, in that sort of a scenario. Um, if, if somebody's, you know, again, smoking and while they're using oxygen um, and they get a flash burn, that would be the E923.2. All right. Why don't we move on? So um, I'm in the next series of slides here, I'm just going to sort of briefly talk about uh, a few things. They won't be nearly as detailed as the decision trees that we've just gone over. Um, but I just want to remind you about a variety of different codes that uh, sometimes are a little tricky. So um, this is a set of codes that relate to injuries involving animals. We've talked about this before, that a fall from an animal being ridden is really considered a transportation code, and it should be E828.2. Um, if somebody was kicked or gored or butted by an animal, that's E906.8. And of course, uh, 
specific codes for being bitten, um, and these are the appropriate codes for being bitten by a dog or bitten by a cat. There's a whole variety of uh, things that can bite you that are listed in the coding manual. These are probably the most uh, common. So. so the next slide talks about machinery. And here the thing to be thinking about when you're coding about machinery is to decide whether or not was the machine in operation, was it doing its normal function, or was it not in operation? It was just sitting there as a big, heavy object. Um, if the piece of machinery is in operation, um, typically it's one of the E919 codes. And um, if you have access to the coding manual and have the opportunity to look in the index under accident caused by or accident machine, it has all different types of machines listed there. Um, and it tells you the appropriate code of the E919 series to use. So if the machine is in operation, you might want to try to look at the index or at least look in the section of the coding manual that describes all the different machines under E919. If the machinery is not in operation, then uh, it's considered to be an object. And so in general, this will typically be uh, place where you use E916, E917, or E918, which are the struck by or, or falling on or that sort of thing. So if the piece of machinery fell on you, um, that sort of thing. And again, um, the recommendation is to look in the index for the cause of the injury, so caught under or pinched between or uh, caught in, that sort of thing. Um, and then it'll guide you to the right um, E916, 917, or 918 code to use. Um, I wanted to highlight SAWS. Um, again, this was something we saw quite frequently in um, our trauma registry in Colorado. Um, there are a variety of different codes that um, address injuries resulting from SAWS. Depends on the type of SAW, whether or not it's powered or not powered, and whether or not it's used for woodworking. So um, you can see these listed here. Any of the larger SAWS or woodworking machines, you use one of the machinery codes, E919.4. If it's a powered hand tool or a powered hand saw, it's E920.1. If it's an unpowered saw, just a regular old saw, it's E920.4. Um, this slide sort of talks, highlights a few of the things about uh, cut, pierce, and firearms. Um, a lot of times when people see the word guns, they automatically sort of drift to the E922 uh, set of codes because those are all about firearms and guns. But the reality is not all those things should be coded as E922. So for example, um, again, we saw quite a few injuries resulting from the use of nail guns. Nail guns are considered a powered hand tool, and you should use E920.1 for nail gun injuries. Paint guns are also something a little bit different. Again, they're considered a powered hand tool, and E920.1 uh, would be the best option there. Now, uh, paint ball guns are a little bit different. And so paint ball guns, um, because those actually involve sort of a projectile coming out of the gun, there actually is a very specific code in the E922 series, um, E922.5, that's specific for use with paintball guns. So in that instance, you would use an E922 code. Um, just a word of caution about the E920.4. Um, that particular code um, is other hand tools and implements. It does not include any tools that are powered. If you're using a powered hand tool, the appropriate code is E920.1. So keep that in mind when you're sort of making a choice. Um, think about, is this a powered tool or a not powered tool? And then finally, um, um, I think most people are somewhat familiar with the firearm codes that are in the E922 series, but I just wanted to highlight that there's um, another code available if it's an injury involving a firearm, but the firearm wasn't discharged. Okay, so this would be like um, uh, the gun explodes and, and gun parts uh, cut the hand or something like that, or somebody sliding a trigger back um, um, and they pinch their finger inside the, the trigger or something like that. So the, if the gun has not discharged, um, then the appropriate code to use would be E928.7. This code also should be used if uh, a person sustains uh, powder burns 
from firearms or air guns. So again, powder burns from firearms use E928.7. And then um, I just wanted to mention, because we're talking about firearms, sorry, just one last thing about firearms, is that if the firearm is used as a blunt object, like your, like a pistol whipping, where somebody, you know, all the bullets have been fired, now the gun doesn't really um, have any more uh, shooting capacity, but somebody's using the gun to sort of beat somebody, then it's then considered a blunt object. And um, if that's an assault situation, then um, the appropriate code to use is E968.2. All right. So I want to move out of the world of um, unintentional injuries and get into the world of intentional injuries. Um, this is, I'm not going to go into the details of these suicide codes, but I just wanted to highlight that um, these codes are used both for suicide, suicide attempts, as well as um, injuries in which somebody intentionally hurt themselves, but they didn't necessarily intend to die. So um, you use these codes that are for injuries that are intentionally self-inflicted, whether or not um, death was the intended outcome. But you don't use these codes if somebody hurt themselves, but it was accidental. So if somebody's cutting themselves because you know, um, a lot of times you'll hear this with teenagers, they cut their wrist with razor blades or those sorts of things. So they are intentionally hurting themselves, uh, but they aren't intending to die. You would still use these codes. But if somebody cut themselves with a knife when they were cutting an apple for lunch, then you would not use these codes. So even though it says self-inflicted, there should be some intent to do harm. Not necessarily death, but intent to do harm. Um, all right, next, uh, next slide. Um, just wanted to highlight a couple things about assault. Um, uh, the codes overall are in the E960 to E969 range. Um, uh, something to keep in mind is most of these assaults involve uh, having some other object, but if this is an unarmed fight or brawl, so nobody has a weapon necessarily, they're just sort of beating on each other, that's E960.0. Um, if you use a blunt object, it's E968.2, and there's a specific code for assault by human bite. Um, I remember, again, in the trauma registry, we would get the somebody uh, hit somebody in the face, and then, you know, sort of the, the teeth of the guy who got hit um, hurt the guy who hit him. Um, and again, uh, there is a specific code if uh, any sort of human bite uh, was involved, so keep that in mind. All right, and um, the, the next uh, slide here is also talking about intentional injuries, and just a uh, little bit of detail about child and adult abuse. If there's uh, intentional neglect or abuse, there's a series of codes E960 to E966, as well as E968, um, that should be used uh, depending on how that abuse happened. And when you assign this code, you should also add another E code from E967 uh, child and adult battering and other maltreatment um, to identify the perpetrator if the perpetrator is known. So just a reminder to include the E967 code if that information is available. And in, um, additionally, um, sometimes there are events that are considered accidental neglect. Uh, this could be uh, when a child is left in a car um, unintentionally, um, and then that child gets heat stroke or has other problems, there's a specific code for accidental neglect, and that's E904.0. So uh, try to make the distinction uh, between intentional versus accidental neglect. Uh, the next slide um, talks about terrorism. When I started in the trauma registry 15, 20 years ago, these codes didn't exist. But uh, after about 2002, they became part of the ICD-9CM coding manual. And unfortunately, I think some of you registrars have had to use these at different times. And I'm thinking of the uh, folks in Massachusetts with the, the Boston Marathon. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if you're using these terrorism codes, the event must be identified by the FBI as being an act of terrorism. So you can't just sort of decide by yourself that terrorism was involved. Uh, it has to be something that's been identified by the FBI. And the other thing to keep in mind with these terrorism codes is that if you use one of these uh, terrorism codes, then you don't assign any of the other um, E codes from the assault categories. 
um, you should be able to capture all the information you need uh, using just one of the E979 codes. So you wouldn't um, include any of the um, assault codes with this. All right, so that's um, what I wanted to cover with regard to sort of the individual um, ICD-9 codes and, and sort of some coding guidelines or coding tips with regard to that. I'd like to now move uh, to talking about the um, CDC's ICD-9-CM external cause matrix. And um, this was a matrix that was developed so that there could be standardized reporting of injuries by mechanism and by intent of injury. Um, this has something that's been developed internationally, and it was a way for uh, groups to be able to compare uh, common injuries by having a, a consistent understanding of what codes go into a given box. Um, this, uh, I'll show you the matrix in a minute if this link works, but um, in any event, um, the way that the layout of this matrix is is that the rows includes the mechanism of injury and the columns um, include the intent of injury. So uh, let me show you the website. And as we sort of scroll down here, you'll see, um, as I mentioned, over on uh, the left-hand side, the headings to all of these rows are different types of mechanisms or causes of injury. And then each of the columns, you'll see unintentional, self-inflicted, assault, undetermined, and other. So here's the layout of the codes and sort of uh, what's there for them. So um, if you're interested in knowing what's on this matrix, you can go visit this website, you can look at these particular codes. But this is sort of how we uniformly think about the different uh, categories. The other thing that's on this website, if you can scroll down a little bit uh, towards the bottom, um, is that this website also has a nice listing of um, all of the E codes that have been added and when they were added. So if you look down here at table two, you'll see um, a listing of um, the new ICD-9 uh, yeah, external cause of injury codes and the year that they were implemented. So, you know, um, up until 2011, they were adding new codes. Uh, since 2011, they have not been adding new codes because we're sort of gearing up for the migration to ICD-10 CM. But in any event, if at some point you want to understand when was a code added, Here's a nice listing of when these codes were added. So um, that particular website might be helpful for some of you to take a look at. So moving from there, um, I, I just want to talk for a minute about what um, the National Trauma Data Bank now has done. Um, you know, the National Trauma Data Bank uh, has some calculated fields, and one of the calculated fields that they have is trauma type. And um, what they do is um, they look at the external cause code that's been assigned and um, um, map the external cause code to a particular trauma type. Now, the layout of the, the, these columns here are pretty much based off of the CDC external cause matrix. So, for example, when you see the mechanism description of cut peers, those are all the E codes related to cut peers. And that um, particular grouping of codes has been assigned trauma type 2, which is a penetrating injury. Okay? So what the National Trauma Data Bank does is take the E codes in the data that you have and then assigns them to blunt, penetrating, thermal, flame, that sort of thing. And it's all sort of based on um, this external cause matrix. So again, it, it sort of highlights why you might want to take a look at the external cause matrix. You might want to take a look at, you know, um, the categorization and what happens when you pick a particular E code. Um, and um, I think this is done to sort of pr provide some consistency um, among the data um, in terms of what gets assigned for trauma type. I know in Colorado we had a lot of conversation about what was blunt, what was penetrating, what were the definitions. And I can see why having this sort of standardized process really makes things um, a lot simpler. So uh, with that, um, that's basically what I have to say about um, ICD-9-CM. Um, I think in the future there's planning to be an ICD-10-CM webinar. And uh, just to give you guys a heads up, if you um, think that the ICD-9-CM has too many codes, well, ICD-10-CM has nearly six times as many external cause codes as ICD-9-CM. So there's even more detail available to you in ICD-10-CM. So 
uh, I think that's going to be um, a challenge. In any event, um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you, and I'm happy to uh, answer what questions we have. Thank you, Dr. Hedegaard. Um, we have a couple more questions before we finish up today. Um, first question is, are roadways in gated communities with homeowners associations considered public or private? Um, I would consider those private. Uh, what e-code should you use for an off-road vehicle, uh, i.e. dirt bike, uh, collision with a car on a public road? So um, the ruling is that um, the roadway takes precedence over off-road. So uh, if there's any part of this that involves a public roadway and a motor vehicle, um, you would use the E810 to E19. Uh, there's been some discussion regarding whether a car hitting a tree on the side of the road was considered traffic or non-traffic event. Uh, can you advise what your opinion would be on the matter? Um, I would say if it's a tree, um, I would call it uh, non-traffic. Because typically the tree is not like right uh, within the roadway. The, the question that I've had more frequently is like a light pole or something that's like right on the edge of the highway. And, and I have a tendency to think of a light pole uh, that's right on the edge of the highway as highway and as a um, on a public roadway. So I would use traffic for that. The tree thing, I guess I would call that um, off-road. It's sort of subtle. It's really tricky. So if someone was running on the top of a car, uh, for instance, car surfing, uh, and they fall off, are they considered a passenger, uh, not a pedestrian? They're considered a passenger because they were on a vehicle. Okay. Next question asks if you could define what you interpret as public use traffic area, since roadways seem to mean the paved part of the highway uh, where there's not usually public traffic all the way to the boundary lines of the highway. And would you mind reading that question again? I'm, I'm not sure I quite got right, it. Yep. <clears throat> Can you define what you interpret as the public use of a traffic area, since roadways uh, seem to mean the paved part of the road of the highway. Uh, in so certain there, areas, there are uh, usually public. Uh, there's public traffic to the boundary lines off the highway. And I apologize. I guess I'm not getting this question. What came to mind was questions about whether or not a sidewalk is considered part of a public roadway and a sidewalk is not considered part of a public roadway. But I don't know if that's what this person is asking and I apologize, I'm just not getting the gist of the question. Okay, we'll, we'll follow up. Yeah, uh, whoever wrote that question, if you if you could provide more detail, I'm happy to answer it offline afterwards. I'm sorry, I just, I, I don't quite get um, the nuance of what you might be asking. Is an intentional jump from a building with suicidal intent the same as a fall? No, there's actually a specific code for um, suicide jumping from building. And hold on one second, and I'll see if I can look it up real quick. So um, E957 is suicide and self-inflicted injuries by jumping from a high place. So it would not be considered a fall, it's, it's a uh, specific code. And there's several options within uh, E957. Do you have any recommendations for resources, either text or computerized, to guide a beginner through the e-coding process? Um, what I would recommend is to get a good coding manual and just read the section on e-codes. Uh, it, it, it takes a little bit of time. But um, it's well worth it to work your way through there. And once you sort of read through it, you can start to see the logic of how these codes are set up. And that helps give you a lot of guidance. And what really helped for me was to read these definitions and read the what's included, what's excluded, and the examples in the coding manual. So um, that would be my first piece of advice, because uh, it just really helps to understand this yourself and not sort of rely on you know, here's my drop-down list of six codes and which one am I supposed to pick. And what about a resource for activity codes? 
So activity codes are sort of interesting. We didn't really talk about those at all today, and I don't know how many trauma registries uh, capture the activity codes. Um, those get added to on and on and on. Um, I would suggest uh, looking at that initial website that I mentioned in my second or third slide from NCHS, because on that website you can download the entire ICD-9-CM coding manual, and the activity codes are uh, included as part of the uh, index to the external causes. No, excuse me, they're included as part of the um, section of, of codes around external cause codes. So that's where you can find the full list of all the um, activity codes that are available. Um, when you look at the CDC matrix, is a 906, uh, parentheses, bite codes a penetrating in injury? Uh, so, <laughs> could somebody pull up the matrix? I don't know that I have it right in front of me here. Hold on one second. So you were asking about 906? I thought that was mm -hmm. a dog bite. So, Let's see, so 906, it's interesting. Uh, 906 is included with other natural and environmental. And um, in the, uh, the way that the NTDB has that map to trauma type, um, that category goes to other and unspecified. So those dog bite injuries uh, from E906 end up being not considered penetrating, uh, best I can tell, in the National Trauma Data Bank, unless they've made any changes about that. How is trauma type determined when we submit more than one e-code to the NTDB? And to be honest with you, I don't know. I was thinking about that myself because when I was uh, speaking earlier about, you know, you're supposed to assign as many e-codes as are relevant. Um, uh, I don't know how NTDB uses that. I think that's part of why the instructions were, you know, whatever is the e-code that's um, associated with the most serious diagnosis, if you put that one first, then at least um, theoretically uh, some aspect of, of that area of concern would show up in the NTDB. And I guess what I'm thinking of is the issue of, you know, people who fall through a plate glass window. So is that blunt or is that penetrating? Well, if, if there's broken glass involved and you end up using one of the codes for broken glass, um, that's in the world of cut pierce, and so it should end up with a trauma type of penetrating, even if you also had included a code for the fall, which would come up as a blunt in the NTDB. So uh, bottom line is I'm not sure how NTDB handles um, when you have more than one e-code. I guess you'd have to ask somebody from NTDB that. Um, I, I think if, you know, most uh, trauma tends to be blunt, so if you're really concerned and you really want to make sure that the penetrating aspect of this injury happened, you might want to keep or, or include the, the code related to penetrating trauma as the first mentioned e-code just in case they only assign based on first mention. But uh, again, I'm not sure how NTDB operates uh, with regard to multiple external cause codes. Uh, the next question that I hope you can answer, do you have a good coding manual you can recommend to the group? We've had a couple of questions on that. <laughs> well, and because I work for the federal government, I can't, uh, <laughs> I can't recommend particular products. Um, you know, I would just make sure that um, it has the level of detail that you want, and if you're willing to go to our website at the National Center for Health Statistics, you can download it for free. So um, what I would recommend is going to the, our website, uh, if, if, you're, if your resources are limited, go to our website and then find a chapter that's specific to external cause codes and just download that one chapter, or, or at least only print out that one chapter. That one chapter by itself is close to 100 pages, so just a heads up on that. So, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I uh, don't really endorse specific products or, you know, this is better than that one. I think we all end up with our favorites, so. Okay, um, the next question uh, again is a hypothetical of if a firecracker exploding in your hand causes burns with partial finger amputation and it occurred on a street, is this coded as an explosion or a burn? So there actually are specific codes for fireworks. 
and that's under the set of codes for explosions. Um, let me look that up real quick, and my coding manual is now all over my desk, so I apologize if it takes me a while to get to the right pages. Um, so um, there's a specific uh, code for explosions or burns and ex uh, from ex uh, fireworks, and that's E923.0. Uh, can you advise on an accident involving uh, riding a lawnmower? So there's actually a specific code for injuries uh, for driving a lawnmower, um, and it's E920.0. So that's a powered lawnmower, and it means whether or not it's riding or not riding, it's powered. Okay, since we're getting close to the end of our time, uh, and unfortunately we have a number of questions left, um, we, uh, we are going to come to a close this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Hedegaard, I would just ask if you could um, highlight the website that people can go to for, uh, to access some of this information. Um, and uh, we have your contact information up there, uh, so if there are additional questions and you'd like to direct them uh, to Dr. Hedegaard, um, her contact information is on the screen at this time. Uh, we will provide uh, some additional uh, resources, including that web link um, for you to access uh, um, uh, on the CDC's website. Um, and uh, uh, again, as we had outlined at the beginning of the webinar, uh, the slides will be sent to the emails you use to register for the webinar this afternoon. Uh, the webinar was recorded and will be available for member, um, member access on the APS website uh, beginning early next week, uh, as well as the slides will also be available on the APS website. I want to take this opportunity on behalf of the ATS uh, to thank Dr. Hedegaard for this uh, very informative uh, informational webinar this afternoon. Um, as we had discussed, uh, the second part of this webinar uh, dealing with ICD-10 external clause codes uh, will be offered in, uh, in the coming weeks. We will send out some information when the date and time is identified. Um, again, thank you very much for your time today, and we look forward to continuing uh, to provide you with uh, registry information and education. Have a good afternoon.